It's even got my little watermark. That's nice. What's that? It's even got my little watermark. [laughs] Yeah. Yeah, that's a nice one. And I just grabbed your screen here and using that uh title. Perfect. I'm actually recording now and on air and we are recording at the Starbucks game actually, so that's kinda cool. [laughs] Very cool. Yep, yeah. And the audio guy for the Canadian ones, they're giving us a voice over here. Oh, they're giving you a voice? Oh, that's pretty good. Yeah. [noise] That's pretty good. Yeah, that's pretty good. Do you wanna do our feed? Yeah, I will. I will. [noise] Show the food. Should be coming soon. Or we can have a quick bite. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Could be. Now this is definitely gonna be a calzone. Oh like you said [laughs] It does kinda look like a calzone, yes. Put those on after cheese. Mmm. Calzone. I tend to just put the cheese on last. Unless there's something I wanna be crispy. All right, good morning everybody. Um, I wanted to kind of share a fun ad hoc lecture with you all today. Kind of a follow up with what we discussed yesterday at our our little conference. Thanks to those who guys were there. Hope you, hope you guys enjoyed it. Um, I've got a lot of stuff so I want you guys to jump in and ask questions. It'll make it much easier for me to direct. There's a bunch of the kind of ideas I've been finding over the last couple years. I've been trying to put them together in one place. Uh, and I'm, and I'm calling this the second renaissance. Because I think something really exciting is happening in the world right now. And I think you all are participating in it. You're getting to see it first hand. And to sort of living through a scientific revolution and a cultural revolution. So I think it's an exciting time. And I think it'll help to be aware of that, right, when I started to wake up and realize that. So that's what I'm calling the second renaissance. And you know, what is, what was the first renaissance, right? The first renaissance was this idea that people had that they needed to go back in time and look at older ideas. Ideas that had been forgotten, that sort of left on the bookshelf and weren't part of the everyday culture anymore. But they were part of an everyday culture previously. And I think this is what we're going to see with what's happening in the world right now. I think artificial intelligence and this chat bot and the ability for every person to go on there and talk about whatever they want to talk about is going to allow us to bring ideas that are essentially kind of dusty. They've been sitting on the shelf and we haven't thought about them, some of them in thousands of years. And I think it's an exciting time to kind of jump in and reconsider these things. So, um, you know, yesterday we were talking about this, uh, you know, kind of search in, in outer space. When we think about how many planets there are and how many galaxies, we expect to see some aliens, essentially. We expect to see some life forms out there and we haven't found any. And so one of the ideas is that the Earth is in just a, such a rare place. And they call this the Goldilocks zone, that there's a very narrow band between the distance you could be from the sun, such that it's not too hot and it's not too cold, this idea of Goldilocks. But there's another version of that from psychology, and it's the idea that we perceive the world. We see the world and understand it and try to make sense of things in a way that's not too simple, but not too complicated. We try to understand the world just as it is. We look out and we see a tree, and we're like, all right, that's a thing that sits out in the field in the sunshine, but it has a lot of complexity to it. It's countless protein molecules interacting, it's DNA and all of that, but normally when we look at a tree, we don't bother with that kind of complexity. So I would argue that we're going to need to kind of expand our, our perceptual window to, to better understand how we're going to get to this next future that the AI is presenting us with. So in this pursuit, I, this idea of info hazards, that there's things that are sort of dangerous to the current way you think of things. If we think about the modern world, there was a time when it was sort of dangerous to talk about the sun being in the middle of the solar system. Everybody thought the earth was in the middle and it was sort of dangerous to the community to talk about such a radical idea that the sun might be in the middle. And so this idea of info hazards, I think we're in that situation now. We just don't see it that way. If we go back to the end of the 19th century, people thought that science and physics was basically done. Max Planck's advisor famously told him, don't bother going into physics and chemistry, everything has been studied already. Um, in, in early 1903, the New York Times suggested that airlines and airplanes were going to take one to 10 million years to develop. It was later that summer that the first airplane took off, right? And so certain ideas about the future can be sort of uh, hazardous to the way we think about things now. And so here's an artifact that I've been trying to, uh, to understand how this fits into our timeline. So about 100 years ago, off, the, off an island in Italy, some divers came up and they found statues underwater. At first they came up kind of screaming and, and, and yelling. They thought they had seen some stuff underwater and it was just these old statues, the arms and legs, and it kind of frightened them. And when they went back and they found that it was one of the best preserved shipwrecks from antiquity. And amongst the wreckage, this device was captured and brought up. And it took a very long time for people to figure out what it was. Now this thing has been radiocarbon dated to around 200 BC. 
And when people went and finally figured out what this thing is or did, it's an analog, astronomical, mechanical computer. This object doesn't really fit into our conception of how the history of technology works by about two millennia. This single device is like, it, it's outside the timeline. We don't know where to put this in the history of the world as far as we understand it. And so that's what we kind of want to think about is how do we look back at the past? We have, we have this notion that, that was, it was simpler and that we are just so much smarter and we can just, you know, they didn't even have the, the stuff that we have, the technology we have today, so how could they have known anything? Well, this is a very sophisticated device that could keep track of the planets and the moon and the phase of the moon and the time and the date and all of these kinds of things that most people today would have a hard time wrapping their, their heads around. I think if you gave me a budget of, of $50,000, a team of four people and a 3D printer, I would have a very hard time building this thing. I don't think it would be easy for me to recreate this thing and, and with the internet and everything else. Right? And so it's extraordinary. Who made this and how? Right? I don't think this was the work of a lone genius you know, sitting in the cave and just came out with it one day. Where did they go to kindergarten? What did their elementary school look like? You know, what did they go to college for, so to speak? Right? They must have been in an artisan community and a, and a scientific community and an astronomy community to have all of this knowledge. This is not the knowledge that fits into one human mind. This is a, a product of a whole culture. So in my sort of uh, history or my pursuit of looking at the history of neural networks, I've gone back farther than I ever thought I, I had to, and I find interesting objects like this. Um, and this is a, you know, a, a, a cryptological magnetic machine. And I would have thought things like that are from the last hundred years, not from the last thousand or two thousand years. So who made this sort of thing and what were they doing with it? Um, if we were to find an object like this, right, we've been discussing this idea of techno signatures. How could we find evidence of an advanced civilization or an advanced intelligence? If we found something like this thing on the left, what would you think of it? Right? I think it might be a necklace or an ornamental skirt or something like that that you would wear, or some sort of ceremonial piece. But it, it's what I would call a data structure, right? It's a, it's a physical way to represent algorithms and data. And the, the, the economy and the social information was stored in record keeping in this way, right? For thousands of years, there's only a few of these that have survived into the modern world, and it's not quite understood how they encoded the data they did and what, how all the algorithms worked. It was mostly lost. Largely because when another civilization encountered it, they couldn't perceive what it was and worse, they couldn't appreciate what it was. This is a map of the currents, of basically how to travel in the Polynesian islands. That the sticks and the shells here represented the waves and the swells and the currents that you would need to follow to survive to get across the ocean in a little canoe. If I were to see something like that, I might just think it's, it's children's art or maybe it's a board game or something like that. I think it would be almost impossible for me to just see that de novo and just, oh, okay, of course, that's how you, that's a GPS-like map to get across the ocean. So when we're sort of looking at history and we're looking at nature and we're looking at cultures, I think we have to have this Goldilocks zone of, of not just eating the porridge that's right, but the cold porridge, the hot porridge, the spicy porridge, the stuff that doesn't even look like porridge and so on. We now know how uh, powerful binary numbers are and computers. The idea goes back you know, 400 years or so to Leibniz. And uh, here you can see the scribbling. And so if somebody were to go through his notes, uh, you know, imagine when a scientist uh, dies, all the notes left on their desk is called their knockloss. And Leibniz left an enormous knockloss of notes that people to go through. And so imagine if you hadn't invented the computer and you're going through it 50 or 100 years later and you see the scribbles of ones and zeros, is that a big deal? How would you know that's a big deal? Right? But that changed the world, these ideas. So we ha I found this, this woodcut that I really like. It's got this personification of arithmetic and uh, these sort of two different schools of thought when it comes to mathematics. Most people in the West are learned the sort of the Arabic numerals and how to manipulate them uh, by drawing sort of lines and, and, and manipulating the figures and carry the one kind of stuff. But there's a whole other way of doing uh, arithmetic, and it's the abacus. Did anybody learn the abacus growing up? Are you good at it? Yeah, can you do it? Yeah. Are you faster with this one or that one? Not that faster, but I know the basis of it. You can do it, yeah. And if you look, they have uh, competitions in certain places where the kids get so good at it 
they don't even need the actual abacus anymore. I don't know if you've seen this. They can just kind of like do it with their fingers in their head and they just like pretend to do the abacus and I guess they just keep track of it in their mind. So they just write it into their palm? Yeah. yeah, that's amazing. So they're using like their tactile representation. Do you know something called Chisholm Bob? Is that similar? Yeah. <coughs> Definitely. That's in that there's that's one of the families of things that you can do, absolutely. Um, and so I would argue that this has kind of been underrepresented in the modern education. This is a very, very powerful technique. You know, we learned about Roman numerals and stuff, right? The I and the V and all that. But the Romans had little, they had these. They had little pocket calculators, you know? The kids now, they can just do it in their hand. But they had little, little bits of metal with these things. I would argue that computers are closer to this kind of math, and AI is more like that kind of math. And there's very powerful algorithms in that approach. I was shocked to see this. In looking up the abacus, I found this. This is this, a checkered square from 1177. And this is what essentially, we could think of it now as like a board game. This is where checkers and chess came from, but they're doing math. They're sort of doing like a monopoly game, but for real, right? It's not pretend, it's the actual banking of the financial empire that they're running at the time. And by moving the by things around that board in that position, uh, you know, calculations are being done. This is essentially algorithms. This is what we now call computer science. The computer wasn't made out of electricity or anything, but the process of storing variables into certain locations and all that, that's now what we call computers. So this machine, um, the 1592, this sort of arithmetic organ. So I'm always continuously shocked. I think that you know, computers are much more recent, but to see that this sort of idea goes sort of way back was sort of uh, really exciting for me. So that idea was, was uh, taken up by Vanny Var Bush, and he built this enormous analog computer. And this thing you can use to design the factory throughput. You can design the, the airfoils on, on, on uh, airlines and wings and things like that. And I call these products, these technologies, victims of their own success. Because it was so awesome and that it worked, they don't really tell anybody about it. Right? You could make this as a toy and teach kids how to do it. But you can also use it to design sort of uh, weapons of war and economies. And so it wasn't really... Uh, declassified essentially until much much later to the point where we have different kinds of computers now. So uh, this guy here, von Neumann, he took that, that general concept and he made it electrical with, uh, with von Neumann, I mean with uh, Turing and so on. The, uh, you know, lots of people were involved. But these two get sort of a lot of the, the big credit. On, on the left here we have Oppenheimer and he was the one who did the Manhattan Project. And so uh, these computers were important you can see von Neumann saying, he's saying they're more important than bombs because one, you need them to make the bombs. So, right? so if, if nothing else, it's just the first, first step in bomb making. But I think that von Neumann realized that for science um, and even for physics, that this was a really big deal. That you know, creating a computer is like creating a new world. And we can do experiments in there that you can't do out, outside in, in, the regular, in the regular world. So uh, one of the other sort of threads that came to merge with computation is this idea of cybernetics. And, um, this comes from the Greek word Kubernetes, which is the guy who sits in the back of the, the rowboat and steers. And so it's the idea of steering the system. And this originally came from when airplanes started to come in as, as high-speed bombers, and it was really hard to kind of essentially shoot them down, right? They're going fast, and you have to kind of, you know, aim the cannon before the airplane gets there. And that problem is very difficult to do. So they built a machine to do that, and they invented this field of cybernetics to make something that can automatically do that. But that, again, that's also a victim of its own success. They don't, they don't, we didn't learn that in grade school because it's precisely the kind of thing you use to shoot down airplane, right? That sort, of, that sort of stuff. It becomes very important. But as the people who are involved with it, it's, it's a really important idea, not just for the practical thing of defending your airspace or something like that, but for, for the ideas of the world and sort of almost in a philosophical sense, how, you know, what we are, what animals are, and so on. All right, so... In this idea of trying to understand how humans control themselves, how our brain works, I came across this, this amazing uh, uh, science fiction story called Snow Crash. Uh, Neil Stevenson is actually the one who coined the term metaverse, which you hear about a lot now. But that's probably the least interesting part of the story. The really interesting part of the story is about language. And it's about uh, how inputs to our brain can control how we think, how the words that we use control how we think. And in the story, there's a very particular pattern 
that if you're a computer programmer and you know binary, then you'll be susceptible to this, this pattern. And if you see this pattern, it, cr it crashes the person the way your laptop might crash with a blue screen. And when I first came across this story, I thought, well, this is a clever sort of fictional idea, but it's really silly. It doesn't make any sense. You know, clearly people wouldn't crash just because they saw a picture. But what's amazing, or not amazing, or something I think we need to be considering, is this is exactly the type of vulnerability that neural networks do have. And so the machine learning systems that we've been looking at, these, these convolutional neural networks, these fully connected neural networks, they were originally designed as models of the human visual system. Going back in the 40s and 50s and 60s, people tried to reverse engineer individual neurons to see what they were doing, and that's where we got all of this subject of deep learning. So if these neural networks are a model of our mind and our brain, and they can be attacked in the same way as the snow crash story, maybe we are susceptible to these kinds of patterns, and we need to kind of consider that. Right? So we can take these, these patterns, and what's amazing is you can even put subtler patterns that you wouldn't necessarily know are strange, but this will throw off the AI into not recognizing that as a stop sign. Now, a human wouldn't get, get uh, perturbed by these, but uh, we can craft those stickers in just the right places to where the machine would get confused. Are people, is that what magicians do, right? Magician goes, look over here, and then pff, they have a rabbit over there. And you know, they did just something really kind of mundane by getting you to look over here while they were taking something out of their pocket. But, but they did just that. We didn't notice it. Right? And, and it, it works, right? The, the, the movies work, right? We, music works, all these kinds of things. We know they're not what we think they are. We know it's not real, per se, but we entertain our mind just the same. You know, what's the limits of that? So we could take this a step further and not just sort of uh, trick the network into giving the wrong answer, but actually co opting it to do a task it was never designed to do. And so uh, the scenario I like to imagine is. Somebody just for, uh, they raised donation to run a wildlife camera in the forest. And that thing is going to look for, you know, whatever the animals might be that you've trained this thing to look for. And um, somebody has donated all the money to run the cloud time for that neural network. But that neural network only has seen animals before. And the only words essentially that can come out of the neural network's mouth are tench, goldfish, white shark, tiger shark, and so on. It can only say names of animals. It can't do anything else. But I have another task, right? I want to imagine this is cars in a parking lot or something, and I run a parking lot, and I want to know where my cars are available. But I don't want to pay the cloud credits for that. I want to steal the cloud from the, uh, the nature preserve. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my problem, which is this, and it's the problem of counting squares, right? Four and 10 and so on. I'm going to take my problem, and I'm going to put another board, I'm going to put a border around it, a very carefully crafted border, just like in the, the, the the story Snow Crash, and this border will trick the network in such a way that when I send it this one, it'll output Tiger Shark, but Tiger Shark is code for four squares. And if I give it 10, it'll say Ostrich, and Ostrich is code for 10 squares. And so I've gotten this network to do a completely different task. It doesn't know anything about counting. It was never asked to count during its training. Its weights were never configured to do a training, to do a counting task. The network doesn't know it hasn't seen an animal picture, and it doesn't know that it's given an answer that's actually code for something else. That's a really strange idea, right? Um, you know, we have to, I think, consider if we could be co-opted that way and what the consequences of that would be. And so you can attack a lot of different kinds of networks and get them to do these different things. Okay, so there's another story I want to mentioned like Snow Crash, and this one's called Babel 17. And rather than just a specific image that sort of crashes your mind here, there's a language. And so there's a code breaker, and they're tasked to, to, break this, to break this code. And they come back and they say, it's not a code, it's a language. And the thing about this language is as you learn it, it installs a new personality into you, right? It changes your mind. It changes who you are. And I think this is a really, really interesting idea. I'd be curious to talk to folks that, that speak more than one language. You know, do you think differently in that language and, and, and so on? We, th we think, I, I used to think that English was good enough or whatever, right? But maybe it's not. Maybe there's, word, maybe there's ideas I can't think about precisely because I'm trying to think about them in English, right? We know the Eskimos have more words for snow and we know that the Arabs have more words for sand and so on, right? It's, it's, it's suggested that the people who spoke Sanskrit had more words for emotional states, more different ways to understand cogn cognition and consciousness. Um, 
you know, we just have things like, I'm happy or I'm sad. Well, that's a pretty broad category, right? What kind of happy? What kind of sad, right? Maybe we need better words for those things. And so I think that's why we had to reconsider language. All right. And so in the, uh, the third book I want to mention that have these sort of related themes of info hazard, right, sort of signals that sort of can mess with your mind. So the first one is this image that can crash your mind. The other is sort of a language that if you, if you so much as learn that language, it's going to change how you think. And then the, the third one here is this idea of a macroscope. And so this is sort of like a James Webb telescope type device, but it can see all the way across the galaxies and all the way across the universe in real time, and you can see sort of everything at once. And in that big picture uh, is sort of a fatal experience. Because the people who, who operate this machine, they don't really survive that in the, in the regular sense, right? They don't die outright, but their mind sort of doesn't survive. I think we need to be careful that I think the, the AI is going to do this. The AI is going to provide us such a broad picture and it's read so many books and it has so much context that the, the vista that it's going to show us is essentially going to be somewhat lethal to our, our conventional culture. I think we're going to have to have some kind of cultural and scientific revolution in some sense. Um, hopefully not, not worse than the ones we've had over the last few hundred years. But I think it's going to change how we think. They say that to have read all the material the chatbot has read, you have to, it would take 20,000 years. Right? I can't read books in Sanskrit and, 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 and Hungarian and Portuguese and Spanish and French and everything else. And I'd love to, right? I'd love to, but I, but I can't. And I want to have some machine that can make those ideas uh, digestible to me. So um, we have this idea of the Tower of Babel, right? Which is a theme we see in a lot of different cultures. And it's the idea that there's sort of too much power in, in mankind if they all share the same language. And so uh, in the story in the Bible, uh, humans were building this tower and sort of uh, getting a little too cocky. And God said, hang on, um, I'm going to scatter the languages. And so there'll be some confusion of the tongues. And you won't be as productive. I think we need to think about what the AI chatbot is doing. It's, it's sort of unconfusing the tongues. You can ask it all kinds of questions in any language, and then it can answer you in any other language. I think that's something we've never seen before. And I think that's really going to change things. So in this confusion of tongues, I came across this idea of the dancing plague, this uh, sort of a musical contagion. So this would be an info hazard uh, of an audio type. And I've said I'm not sure if I would want to hear this song or not hear this song. I'm kind of curious what the melody might be, but then it might ruin you. So a spontaneous outbreak that's relatively well documented in the Middle Ages is this dancing plague that happened for about a month or so where a spontaneous group behavior emerged. It's not quite clear why this behavior emerged, why people didn't just go home after an hour, why didn't they just sit down after 10 minutes and say that was fun, but something compelled people to just get caught up in this mania and they didn't stop. Some of them danced to their death, uh, just from sheer exhaustion, from not stopping to sleep and eat and, and so on. How, how does that sort of behavior come about? Are, you know, are we susceptible? If we were just in that mix, would we join the dance? I don't know. You know we have, of course, we say to ourselves, no, of course, why, why would I? But why did those people, why did they get caught in that? Right? Everybody knows that the ants follow their trail, right? Well, you, you can see ants every once in a while, they, their trail will sort of bite itself accidentally, and the ants will just march in a circle for so on. Is this that same kind of a thing? Right? We don't know. Uh, what's, what's fascinating, it, it's, it's really difficult to parse out the history because there's just so many layers of, of obfuscation. As different cultures, cultures and religions and political systems, you know, over the thousands of years took over, uh, certain ideas had to get hidden and, and, and masked and essentially um, disguised as other things. And so there's this fascinating overlap between this sort of dancing plague and tarantula bites and musical remedies that's just like such an awesome tangle, just like the ants. And, and I've been trying to sort of parse out, okay, what's the cover story? What's the actual story? Uh, does music help with spider bites? And you know, so on, that sort of thing, right? Or was that just an excuse for sort of ancient uh, mystery cults and baccalaurean rites, right? Were they just uh, hallucinating or something and people had to blame it on a spider? Okay, so and the, the, the fourth book I want to mention is Voyage to Faramido. And this is a, an amazing book about uh, a synthetic musical intelligence, a sort of alien life form sort of thing that's made out of machinery. But this book is older than the word robot, right? 
Um, and in this story, these, these uh, synthetic beings, they speak in music. And I think more importantly than speaking in music, they think in music. And I think that's one of the more interesting ideas I've ever come across. Uh, I'd love to think in music. I don't know really what that means yet. But I, I, think, I think I think in English. And I, I want to know what it would be like to think in, in music. And so trying to chase down that idea, um, I came across an actual language developed in the 19th century called Sol Re Sol. And this is a, a constructed language. And there's only a few thousand words in it. And the, the alphabet is the notes in the Do Re Mi. So we only have seven letters in the alphabet. And we can think, but each alphabet, like with our alphabet, we have two representations of each letter. We have capital A and lowercase a. So there's sort of two versions of each thing. For this, there's multiple versions of each letter, right? So we can think of the first letter as one, or we can think of it as do, or we can think of it as red, or we can think of it as do, or we can think of it as that circle, or we can think of it as the position on the staff, right? So it, it has all of it. You can think of it as cherry, right? I think it, is a, it could be cherry, orange, lemon, lime, and so on, right? It's however you want to think about it. And so this is sort of a synesthetic language. There's a, there's a, a, a hand gesture associated with each of the seven symbols. And so you can write your ideas in many different forms. Right? Does anyone have synesthesia? Anyone know what synesthesia is? Right? So when some people see certain letters and colors and combinations in, in certain colors. Right? So some people perceive numbers in certain colors and certain letters. Uh, some people have spatial synesthesia, so that sort of a one is here, a two, and a three, and it goes around up like this. Uh, all kinds of different modalities. I don't think this is well understood because traditionally we didn't know where to put that kind of idea in science. Psychology doesn't have the resources to study these things. If you go and you do a psychology experiment in the brain scanner, for example, they don't even include left-handed people because there's not enough of them to account for the statistics. And so you can imagine there's a lot of capabilities that people have that are a lot rarer than being left-handed. Right? Something like synesthesia it would be extraordinarily rare compared to being left-handed. And so if we can't even study left-handed stuff with the tools of science, how, how could we expect to be able to measure these things? Yeah. That's amazing. I, I think that's exactly the kind of renaissance type idea that the modern world just ignored, right? People, people probably said, oh, that's a cool drum, that's, you've got cool songs and all that, great rhythm, not realizing there's an internet there going you know, across the country. Uh, that, that's, that's amazing, yeah. That's the kind of thing that I think we're going to rediscover this ancient knowledge that all kinds of cultures had about how to store and transmit knowledge. And they might have been able to even make decisions with that drum. Uh, there was a colleague I was speaking with a few years ago, and uh, she's from China, and she was describing this instrument that she, she, she described it as being used for thinking. That it's not really for, for making music, it's something like you put your ideas, like you would put ideas on a piece of paper to think them out. You sort of play this instrument to help you think about your ideas. And I, I always thought that was a really cool idea. And so the, the drum could be like that. And um, what that language looks like, you know, the, the West didn't invent Morse code, for you know, thousands of years later, and there already was one, you know, this wireless telegraphy in, in terms of drums. In uh, India, there's a northeastern state called Meghalaya, and the people over there, there's a tribe where sons are born, and their names are actually musical sound composed by their mother when they're born. Wow. They don't have actual like, names like this. They'll be like, uh -huh, uh -huh. It's like an onomatopoeia. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's interesting. That's interesting. There's a, um, a language from the Canary Islands called Silbo Gamero, and it's a sort of a whistle language. And they can, like, they can say sentences. You know, it can be like, dinner's ready, come back home. They can be like, you know, the sheep need to get let out, or whatever it is. They have, you know, relatively elaborate communications. So I think that's what we're going to need to, to think about is sort of a mu more musical language. English has these sort of crashing sounds, ch k p k, all these kind of weird, harsh noises. And I think we need sort of more melodic kind of communication. So imagine when you, when you want to yell somebody's name and they're very far away, right? 
how do you do it? You sort of stretch the vowels out, right? You can imagine doing that in your head. You'd be like, William. You would, you would like carry the vowels for a long time because the vowels actually carry the energy. They're the thing that gets the, the signal to where it needs to go. And in English, the information is in the consonants. It's in where you change those things up. But it doesn't have to be that way. It could be a musical thing. Right? So uh, when this in, was in, originally invented, it, well, the, the, the French army commissioned it um, because they wanted to communicate at a larger distance. You can imagine you could have like a bugle and you could send like, you know, elaborate instructions across a mountain range or something like that. So you can also represent it in these sort of wild glyphs that look like alien language. And so when we think about, you know, trying to decode messages, it's like, well, we have them right here. Would we even recognize that as sort of a language? Has, has anybody seen um, Arrival? Anybody seen the movie Arrival? I don't want to spoil it too much then, because it's a cool movie. But in the movie, there's this alien language that looks like this. Uh, Stephen Wolfram helped develop this language. He's a member of our center. And uh, let's just say that in, as, the, as the human uh, learns to read this alien language, they begin to think fundamentally different. They perceive the world in, in a fundamentally different way and in a very powerful way. And I, I just think that's a really cool idea. And so this is known as the sepia wolf hypothesis, that the language that we use to think changes our perceptions and understandings. Yeah. Exactly, and, and some of those might seem to be sort of less powerful, but maybe they're better, they're optimized for a certain task in some sense, right? I think in the, in the modern world, you know, we look too much through our rearview mirrors, right? We sort of carry all this, this stuff with us, and I think in the ancient world, it, people didn't have to bother with that. There's this idea of, of counterfactuals, that to talk about things, certain languages allow you essentially to, to make a simulated virtual reality and talk about things that didn't happen. And other languages just don't like, they don't, weren't designed to kind of talk about things that, that uh, you know, alternate realities. And so this language allows the sort of learner to, to see a completely different reality. So I don't want to, I don't want to spoil that one too much. Um, so here's what these, um, here, well, here's the soul race soul again. And so I just love the idea that if we see a string of numbers, like one, two, one, three, six, one, five, two, five, that that's actually the sentence, I speak soul race soul. So we can, you can have it as sort of a, like, a, like a Latin, do re, do mi la, do sol re sol, which means I speak sol re sol, or you could have it as the numbers, or you could have it as these squares, you could have it as these dots, kind of like a scantron, you could have it as these sort of funny glyphs. Right? I would love to be able to take ideas and turn them over in my mind in all of these different forms. I'd like to be able to, if I have a, ask myself a question, I'd love to be able to sing the question. I'd like to be able to, to dance it out with my hands. I'd love to be able to, to write it as a score up and down and see the sort of the plot, you know, trace of the ideas go out like that. Now, this language has a lot of structure to it that ordinary languages don't have. If I want the opposite of a word in sol re sol, you just spell it backwards. You just spell the word backwards. In English, if I, I, if, I, if, I want, if I have a word I've never seen before, I can approximately pronounce the word by parsing the syllables and, and sort of and, and sounding it out. In sol re sol, you can approximately define a word you've never seen before. If you parse the syllables in sol re sol, it breaks into a decision tree and it tells you approximately what, what idea space the word is about. And so the words are organized like the Dewey Decimal System in the library. There's a section of books about certain topics. The language is organized that way. All the words that start with do re mean a certain thing. All the start, words that start with do re mi mean something else. And so you can kind of organize the language and parse it out. So it has a lot, a lot of structure that I think would be interesting to learn. Would our brain get more structure from that? So in looking up this idea, I was fascinated to find that somebody built a contraption for this. In 1750s, this piano would sort of turn colored glass and kind of play this light music. And this was considered like the lost language of paradise. Right? So this is our Tower of Babel idea. That it was said that, the, that this kind of language was like the universal language of Eden that we had lost. And I just thought that was too extraordinary of an idea 
to not really be represented anywhere. I haven't, I haven't seen this before. And I'm sort of shocked when I find ideas of this caliber that are kind of underrepresented in our, in our modern culture. That's suspicious to me. And so this color music, right, um, I think it's, it's like this synesthesia language, right? This is sort of soul soul before it even invented. So we had the hardware for it, and then we had sort of the whole language developed. But where is it? Why can't I go on Amazon and buy a keyboard that plays those colors? That doesn't make any sense to me. Why, why have we never heard of that or never seen that? If I were to ask you when the first electric instrument was, I don't think anybody would say 1759 for an electric keyboard, right? Like that seems way too old for that kind of technology. I thought these things were, were much, much more recent. So like the Antikythera mechanism, we, we sort of find these, these artifacts that seem kind of outside the timeline. They don't seem to fit the, the popular conception of when things were invented. Here's another keyboard uh, from uh, you know, uh, the same thing around 200 AD, uh, two, between 200 BC, 200 AD, around that kind of era. And um, this is the kind of keys you could you know, play the keyboard, press the keys, and it would just play. And this was a hydraulic, mechanical, musical computer. This is very sophisticated gearing and, and hydraulics. You know, where does this complexity come from? Excuse me. This looks like a computer program, right? This looks like a 3D printed display. Here we have an acoustic output. We've got a hydraulic power source. We've got a sequencing engine. This is a really complicated artifact. You know, did people just do that just so they could hear sort of carnival music? It doesn't seem likely, right? So it seems that, that music might be more interesting than we think. Um, there's this, when I see this thing, this looks like a MATLAB array. This looks like a, a tensor. Right? This is what you've been learning all summer, is how do we structure our data into these three-dimensional forms so that we can organize it in a way that we can process it. What were they doing this for 1,500 years ago, 2,000 years ago? Why was music this important? Why do they have all these different alphabets, these different scales, that each will put you sort of into a different mood or a different mode? There, there's, there's piano music and violin music. If you put it on for, for five minutes or so, you're going to probably almost want to cry or whatever. How does that work? Right? How does music have that much of an influence on people? And so I've been trying to kind of find, uh, think of, the, 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 of humans like machines. Are we like machines? Are we like computers? We now have these AI computers that are starting to be like us. How much is this just going to mix and we realize we're both uh, special cases of, of the same class of object in some sense? Right? And so I've been trying to think about what a, a programming language for the human mind might look like. And um, if we think about... You know, how would you program a person? Like, uh, you know, what would it look like for people to be programmed with a computer language like a Python? Well, they probably wouldn't recognize it. We wouldn't know that that's happening, right? Just like uh, your apps don't know they're written in Python. Uh, this, this, this programming thing would be very powerful, right? It would be very old. It would be something as old as time. It would be something very new and very popular. People still use it today. It would be worth a lot of money. Uh, the people who were good at it would be famous and wealthy. People would, would train to understand this thing. Um, people people would, 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 would admire the people who are good at it and they'd work their whole life. Everybody would be familiar with it, but nobody would really quite understand it. And if you go and you look at those properties that you think a, human la a programming language for humans might have, music checks off all of those boxes. Right? Music has all of those properties. Everybody is familiar with it. Nobody really knows what it is. You know, the better you get at it, the more sort of wealthy and famous you can be. You know, it has a lot of influence. It's as old as time. It's still right here. We use ancient technology for it. We use modern technology for it. And so I think that's what uh, you've been thinking about is music, that sort of thing. And would we recognize it? So here's an alphabet made out of music, but it's encoded. It's encrypted. This idea of steganography, right? And so this is a, a, a modern topic right here that we have in our research lab of digital watermarking and steganography. And this is an idea that goes back 2,000 years or more where people were not just writing messages in music, but writing hidden messages in music, right? A whole other layer of encryption in, in some sense, right? Hiding it in their double. And I just think that that's extraordinary. And so when we go back and we try to kind of piece together uh, the parts of the world and understand things, I think we need to have a, a wider view of what things might look like. This looks just like the neural networks that you've been learning, right? And so. We don't know the sort of the richness. Just because they didn't have the GPUs to run them doesn't mean they weren't doing the same kinds of things, but in a different thought space. 
So I think we're going to be looking at uh, this, this music of the spheres that the ancients used to talk about. We have so much uh, sort of new, yeah, please. thousand percent and I think this is exactly the kind of sort of ancient knowledge that the people just knew this was this was well understood and science in the last 300 years kind of pushed a lot of those characters off the stage and they said no we don't need that anymore it's it's atoms and cells and organs and we know how that stuff works and we don't need to worry about the feelings that you hear when you hear certain notes but that's changing right people are starting to realize that no 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 this does have a big, big impact on how we think and how we feel, and if the, the music playing, you know, changes changes everything about us in a sense. And so I think that's this idea of the Renaissance is is getting that knowledge from the calypso musicians and and, and understanding why do those notes, uh, you know, operate? They do. Um, what can we do to make better musical medicine? Right. If if that's a real thing, we really need to develop that idea, um, because you know what could be more important than having something like that in a sense? Yeah. So, uh, in the Exactly. Look in terms of frequency and vibration, right? And I think that that's part of this this renaissance. And I think this was ancient knowledge, right? If we go back here, um, you know, this 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 says Egypt on it. I mean, the Egyptians very much understood this idea of uh, of vibration and resonance and all these kinds of things. And then when we got the physics of Aristotle, a lot of that stuff was kind of pushed off the stage. But as recent as a couple hundred years ago, like Fourier analysis. And all the stuff that we see with MP3 and NPEG and the ability to stream like we're doing now, all of this is an understanding of the oscillating nature of the world, that everything is vibration. Everything is a sort of a sinusoidal wave and moves in that. And, and this is at the heart of what music is all about. Uh, when we look at the, the formulas at the heart of quantum mechanics, these are essentially musical, right? The equations for, for quantum mechanics are the same as the equations of notes on a guitar string, right? It's boundary conditions. And, and oscillations, and so it's the exact same kind of formulas. And so I was shocked to see that, uh, like Pythagoras, we think of Pythagoras with, with triangles, but really he was very much interested in music, but the reason why he was interested in music is because he felt that these notes impacted our soul, that they had something to do with how we think fundamentally. And so I would like to learn to think in music. I think that uh, once we sort of sort of put our minds more into a musical framework, I think then we get sort of this, this global harmony that I'm hopeful for. Uh, I think of AGI as sort of artificial Gaia intelligence. I think the whole planet is kind of connecting, but I think we're going to need this sort of music of the spheres and this kind of harmony to bring it together. I think in the ancient world, people kind of sang like the birds and we had this sort of natural language that we had developed from the forest over millions and millions of years. And like the Calypso notes, we just knew what sounded nice and what you know, we could use to, to think and, and, and talk with. And I think we've all forgotten that. I think that's kind of the Tower of Babel. So I think that's kind of the, uh, the, the second renaissance, is the kind of we've got to look and see about some of these ideas that we've been ignoring for a long time. And um, I've got a bunch more slides here, but I'll probably have to, to save those. I want to see if there's anything else I want to show here. Um, so, you know, just to kind of show, like, just the throwback, you know, the, the, the projector itself is sort of like from the Roman Empire, and I, I was shocked to see sort of the history of these sort of television things. Um, I'll just flip through here just to show you that there's sort of this whole extraordinary world that I want you to kind of uh, you know, pay attention to. Because it seems, I, I, I did not like history you know, growing up. I thought it was a, well, it's already been done. It's old by definition, right? No, I would argue that we have this sort of back to the future kind of thing. And, and the history of this AI and all this stuff is strangely going to be decoding all of these things. You know, it's very difficult to, make, to wrap our head around what all of this stuff is all about. But these people knew things. They knew things and they understood the world in maybe ways we don't. And so I think one of the, the big breakthroughs in the second renaissance is that putting the AI to go through here and say, what does all this mean? Right? Why did this person put all these pictures in here? What are all these little symbols supposed to represent? 
And there's some kind of language in here that I didn't get any training to understand, but maybe we can, we can kind of figure this out. Um, so like the Antikythera mechanism, I'm just you know, sort of shocked at how sort of rich the, uh, the ancient world was. And when you see things like this, this is like a paper computer called a nomogram, and you can put inputs on here, and then you can read out things. So that's sort of a, a graphing calculator, kind of like a slide rule. So that's sort of this second renaissance that I wanted to share with y'all. Um, let's see if there's anything else I just wanted to... Just this, uh, this thing here. So, so go back and look. You know, this is the, the, first, the first steam engine uh, from over 2,000 years ago. So go back. As you're looking forward and you want to understand how this artificial intelligence works and, and where this stuff might be going, you know, the thing that I've found is the, is the best guidepost is to look at the past, to see where people have been, where we are trying to go, and then all of the now doesn't seem quite so overwhelming, and we can kind of see this larger trajectory. Um, but, but keep your eyes open and sort of surf this wave. I think we're going to be in the middle of a, of a, a scientific revolution, and you guys are right in the front of it. So. Well, thank you. Let me know if you have any questions. Yeah, I'll post these online. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. I have it on timer. Thank you, Daniel. So uh, go online. The spot evaluations are open this week, but they close at the end of the week. So... Uh, if you enjoyed things here, you can put, you put your notes in there. I've got a million slides I'd, I'd love to show you guys, but we've got too many, so I'll, we'll have to save these for another, another talk. So if anybody wants to try to learn this Soul Race Soul language, we're going to try to put together a, a little you know, practice group on that. We're going to just say hello in it or something like that. We've got the piano over here. I'm not very musical, so it's, it's fun because... I get to kind of, you know, jump into this as a non-musician, right? I don't, does anybody play music? What do you play? Piano. Piano. Awesome. So then you could probably uh, run Soul Ray Soul straight up. Let me see if I can pull up the, uh, the dictionary for it. Now here's the dictionary, just so you can take a look real quick, what this language kind of looks like, right? Um, can you sing the scale? Can you sing the solfege for us? What? Not to put you on the spot or anything, right? Uh, all right, so here you've got your, uh, your do, re, and so on. The sound of music is to throw you off, right? I'm telling you, that song is just to like mess with your head because it sort of ruins it. It's, not, it's nothing like the, the sound of music. That's to throw you off. Um, so here you can see the shortest sounds, the single, the single letters are reserved for really common words, right? And then it's easy because the C is like Spanish already, so that's yes. And the do is kind of like no, so, you know, that's kind of easy. And then if you go down here to the binary combinations, like do, re is I, do, mi is you, do, fa is he, and so on. But you can see that things are, are plural sets, that everything's a synonym. You, they don't bother with gender or things like that. It's just he, she, him, it, or whatever. And then this one's going to be self, oneself. One is going to be the same word for one, the same thing as someone or another person. Um, that these words are all synonym sets, and that's what keeps the language concise. If we go down to three uh, syllable words, right, we can see things like, uh, let's see, they got music on here somewhere, right? Like miracle, supernatural, miraculous is all one word. God, the all powerful supreme being, that's all one word universe and creation. If they wouldn't have the separate words, they would all just sort of merge into one word. And so it's sort of a little poetic that way that you'd have to kind of figure out what the thing is. But there's a whole list of, uh, you know, of elaborate language here. And so you can see these are the, the combinations that are used most often, the ternary. And then once we get to the four part words, now they break down into categories, right? So say in the key of do, all right, so if it's, if it's, four things and it starts with do, then it's going to be related to the physical, moral man, intellectual facilities, qualities and food and so on. And so things like uh, forehead and cheeks and face and, and stuff like that. And then if we scroll down, you can see here's stuff, you know, mustard and salad, cheese, butter. 
Uh, here's, so if it starts with RE, it's things related to toiletries, containing the house, housework, and the family. So the, the words are organized, just like the Dewey Decimal System, into these different categories. Right? Uh, me, a man, actions, and his fault, and so on. Yeah, I, I'd love to hear like you sort of people really communicating in this. Um, I, I've yet to find sort of a real conversation, you know, happening in this language. Um, yeah, exactly. If you've seen Close Encounters of the Third Kind, you know that sort of uh, plays on this on this idea. But the real, I think, interesting idea, you know, if, if music is a programming language and so on, could you be hearing these words all the time in your favorite pop song and you just don't know it, right? What extra meaning could your songs be carrying? Yeah. Oh, okay, yeah, right. Um, yeah, I'll pull, up, I'll pull up the other one in a bit. Let's see. Dedicated to arts and sciences. All right, so that's, that's Soul Race Soul. I've been uh, working in Python to build some apps to help, to help learn it. I want to kind of do some ear training on this to recognize, recognize these things. Uh, in the similar vein, I've been working on some sort of color training. How many colors can you actually name? Maybe a dozen or so, right? Can you name 100? Could you recognize 100 colors and sort them out? But why not? I mean, you could. You can with practice, I'm sure. Uh, what would that do to our brain? Like learning that circle language. Is it better to learn all the differentiations of these things? Right. Uh-huh, uh-huh. That's awesome. In, um, in, in high school, my, my after school job was at a picture frame shop. And they had similar kinds of things, the, the, the paper mats, and they were all different colors. My job was to sort, I had to sort them all by color after they got mixed up. So I think that we'd be kind of better at it. Um, but, but how does that change our mind? Does that give us a better representation of these things, right? Uh, the interesting thing in Falramito is, you know, we think, but we, we typically put ideas into words and we put feelings into music, right? You have sad music, you have happy music, calypso music make you want to dance in a few minutes, right? Without your permission in some sense. You put the right calypso music on or whatever, people are going to start moving, right? Whether you, you didn't have to... They're not gonna, you don't have to ask for permissions or anything like that. It's, it's involuntary. I'd like to have my thoughts be that way. I get songs from the supermarket stuck in my head. Right? And I wake up the next morning and that song's still rattling in my head. I didn't like that. I don't like that song. I want my ideas to rattle around in my head and to echo in my mind. And if I can take my ideas and put them into music. So normally we put feeling into music and we put ideas into words. The idea of Sol Resol or the idea of Favramido is that the thoughts and the feelings were the same thing. That if you, if you put your language into this musical form, that you can think and feel at, at one time. And I think that's something we might have had a long time ago as humans, but we've forgotten. All right, so let's uh, take a quick break for a bit, and then we'll come back and we'll jump back on the projects and, and get everybody caught up on that. Hope you enjoyed the, the crazy ad hoc.